singing, and if you have your Bibles, take a turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the kids are headed down to Kid City. And we want to just take today, today um, we were going to preach on salvation from the future, in the future, about glorification. In, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 2, it talks about the hope of glory uh, that we have in Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about that next week uh, and probably the, week, uh, the next two weeks as I, as I have opportunity to preach. Uh, we'll be discussing that, so I hope you'll come and be a part of that. But I really thought today, just yesterday, I was thinking through some things uh, and just the, the application of the gospel into our everyday life. If, if, if Jesus is not just a bunch of hype, if Jesus is... Uh, the hope that we have, then he has to be able to save us from today. Uh, and today, or this week, or this season in our life, we have this uh, thing. It's almost like a word that I'm just already tired of saying. Uh, but I think, I'm gonna be, I think we're going to be saying it a number of more times. So might as well just kind of keep saying that. Uh, but this, this coronavirus, or the COVID-19, uh, can the gospel save us from this? Can it save us from today in this issue that we're going through? And so we're going to just look uh, and kind of walk through our circles and kind of apply what we've been learning to this one very specific situation. And it really will touch on so many uh, different areas, as, as we'll see here in just a minute. But the cross versus COVID-19. The first thing we want to talk about is God's uh, God's design. Like, uh, is God to blame for this thing? I know that anytime something bad happens, uh, a child dies, a grandma gets a disease, we have a pandemic that breaks out, like, is a very real temptation for mankind uh, to blame God. Or to ask God, well, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? I thought you were love. I thought you cared about us. If there was a God, then this kind of stuff couldn't go on. And so I want you to understand, first of all, this was not God's design. God created a perfect, sinless, innocent world and put man inside of it in his image and gave man the choice what he would do with what God had given to him. And mankind chose sin. Mankind chose brokenness. Mankind believed the lie from the devil that there was something other than God that they needed. And they chose that. And for by, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, death by sin, and death is passed upon all men, for that all have sin. The disease uh, is part of the fall. It's part of mankind's decision that God isn't enough. It's part of being uh, in a, in a, living on a broken earth, okay, that's inhabited by sin and is cursed uh, by sin. It is not God's fault. Um, I asked early in the, in the first service, I said, whose fault is the coronavirus? And someone responded, China, and they yelled it out. I'm not sure uh, they're necessarily to blame. You might be, that's where it came from. But the truth is, is any and all pain, any and all hardship, any and all difficulty that we experience on this globe is the result of sin. It's not God's design. It's not the way God intended to it to do it. It was man's rebellion that caused this brokenness. But we think we're thankful that God is doing something about it. God has done something about it. That He sent Jesus Christ to reverse the curse, to save us uh, from the sin, and to save us in our everyday life. Here's the awesome thing about God, uh, is that there's no doubt that God can use uh, part of our broken world to bring about our good. Like, this thing is horrible. This thing is bad. This thing is not what we wished on anybody. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that God is in such control. He's in such a position. He's so amazing that he can even take what is going on in our own rebellious choices, in our own sinful, broken world, and he can take it and he can use it for good. God can do that. He's, uh, he's strong enough. He's mighty enough. He's smart enough to do that. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Now, how is this possible that God could take something such as this and he could use it for good? God could take this virus that uh, is going on. I, I am just sort of curious about the other 18, but that's maybe another subject for another time, where those uh, come from or where they're at or what's going on. But how can God use this uh, for our good. I want you to understand something about the love of God. It is not a pampering love. We do this with our children. Yesterday, some of my kids said, hey, we want some candy. And I said, no. 
Uh, I, and, they, and they threw a fit. You know, they were wanting some candy, and we were going to go through this whole thing of like, why they're not getting candy? Because it's better for them, because I love them. They just can't eat all the candy all at one time. We're going to space it out uh, over three or four days or over three or four years or, what, you know, whatever, however that is that works in your house. Uh, God's love is not a, a pampering love. It is a perfecting love. God's not just up in heaven saying, oh, yeah, sure, go for it, go for it. Oh, I'm going to make this easy, all these good. No, he's, he, his goal of his love, the purpose of his love, uh, is to perfect us, is to mature us, is, is to help us get back, if you will, to God's design, the original design he had in mind when he created us in the first place. And so we could say, and I do believe, I, I'm not standing up here today telling you all of the reasons uh, why this virus is on our planet, but there is no doubt that God can use this uh, for our good, uh, and that in many times, even in things that are hard, even in things that are uh, difficult, even things that are deadly, is that these are God's mercy. God is merciful to allow this to happen. God is merciful to, as Romans uh, 1 says, to reveal his wrath from heaven to say, hey, uh, I'm upset. Hey, you've offended a holy God. Hey, you're going the wrong direction. Come back. And I'm not suggesting that God put this virus on the earth to get people to come to Jesus. But what I am suggesting is it's part of a broken, sinful world, and even in all of that brokenness, even in all that heartache, even in, the, even in death, that God can take this, uh, and in many ways, we could see this as God's mercy helping us to not live in brokenness, helping us not to believe in a false Savior, helping us not uh, to go our own way, but to realize that we need a different Savior than the one we've been trusting in. That we need a different Savior, that we need a hope, that we need an answer, that we need a cure, and it won't be found uh, in the world. Mankind is so bent on life without God and living in brokenness that we arrogantly forget how dependent we are on God at all times. I mean, think about the chaos in our country just because we are a little worried that we won't have soft paper to wipe our bottoms with. I mean... I mean, let's just get real, real about it. I mean, that just sends us all uh, in a t the, the whole system breaks down almost because we're, we're out of toilet paper. And somehow, in our arrogance, we decide as, men, as human beings to try to live life separate from God, as if there is no God. We worship the creature more than the creator. When we know God, we glorify him not as God, but become vain in our imagination. And our foolish hearts are darkened to not know the truth. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 5. The Bible says that God says, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. You know what the Bible teaches us? That even people who hate God, even people who profess that there is no God, the very breath by which they say those things is a gift from God. The very spirit in which they rebel against God and run into their brokenness and deny the existence of a designer God. The spirit was a gift that has been given them by God. God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul. My friends, we are so, so dependent upon God for each and every breath that we take. And that's why I would say that some of this, some of this is God's mercy and reminding us, hey, big shot, you're not as tough as you thought you were. Hey, big boy, come back over here. Here's where the answer is. Here's where satisfaction is. Uh, here, when you're, when you're thirsty, you can come to me and drink. This is the real well. If God only allowed fluffy things to happen to us all the time, if there was never any uncomfort, if there was any, never any hardship, any difficulty, any uh, bad times, the truth is we would just think we're something. Now, this isn't just us that has this problem. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we can read about the Israelites who uh, God warns them. He says, listen, I'm bringing you into this land. <coughs> that was about the worst thing I could do on a Sunday like this. I really <laughs> apologize. <laughs> Everybody at home on, on Facebook right now is saying, amen, I'm glad I'm not there. I didn't get it from the pastor. Oh, my goodness. So good I'm up here and you're way down there. Anyways. 
And I was worried about having to go to the bathroom in the middle of service. <laughs> uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he says, I'm going to take you into this land, and the houses are full of goods, verse 11. You didn't fill them up. There's wells you didn't dig, vineyards and olive trees that you didn't plant, and you're going to eat, and you're going to be full. In verse 12, he says, Beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and swear by his name. Thou shalt not go after other gods. And if you do, the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. Now, Israel's under a different covenant than we are today. There's some different ways to operate. But I want you to see the illustration here, and that is this, is that when Israel goes in the land, things are great. I mean, Walmart is fully stocked when they enter the promised land. And, and God says, look, what's going to happen is you're going to forget me. And what they do? Just that. And that's because mankind is so bent on brokenness. We're so bent on living life without God and finding another way that isn't another way, okay? A well that isn't really a well, a, a bread that isn't going to satisfy. Uh, and we go after that and we, and we look for that. Uh, and, and God, we see this all throughout the scriptures. This is just one example uh, of mankind and their brokenness. Paul uh, has an experience uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, which is where our, our main text is this morning, where Paul, the Bible says in verse 7 of that passage, he says, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. <laughs> Paul was a, an apostle born out of due time. He didn't hang out with Peter, uh, okay, and James and John and Jesus when Jesus was on the earth. Uh, he came a little bit later. Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. He accepted Christ as a Savior there. Uh, and then from what we understand from Scripture is that he spent some time, uh, revelation given to him by Jesus Christ at a later time. And man, all of this information that was given to Paul as he goes to prepare uh, to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, uh, if, it's sort of like if, if God would have not given him what we're going to read in the second, this thorn in the flesh, that Paul would have gotten a big head about it. Man, I, I spent so much time with Jesus, I know so much stuff, and you don't know any of this, and I'm just somebody that Paul would have kind of got a big head about, and got arrogant and proud, almost as if he didn't for, if we'd forget about the God who gave him the information, the God who gave him the revelation, and just be kind of proud and conceited in himself. So in verse 7, he says, so I wasn't exalted above measure. I have this thorn in my flesh. It's the messenger of Satan, the Bible says, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And, and maybe that has something to do as well with, you know, maybe the way he looked. Maybe some physical thing that was wrong with him that even people wouldn't, you know, put him up on a pedestal. Because we have that tendency to do that uh, to people as well. And he says this in verse 8, I, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice or three times that it might depart from me. <laughs> I, I sort of see myself in there this week. I'm like, you know, I'm like, I get a notification on my phone. I'm like, what? No basketball. Well, that's okay. We have the except. Uh-oh. You know, like it's gone too. Like, and you're like, Lord, like, wait a minute. Like, I, mean, I, I was okay when this stuff was over in Italy. I wouldn't have any you know, problems. But now it's a, sort of a, affecting me. It's affecting, you know, my life. Like, Lord, get this out of here. And you know what the Lord said on Thursday? No. You know, I don't know if we come back to him and start praying on Friday and other things happen. You know, other things, other things, other things happen on Friday. And man, we got, we got to run to the store and get some stuff here. We got to, you know, do, do this and kind of prepare for some uncertain times. And we say, Lord, get rid of this. And he says, no. This is the same situation that Paul was in. He had some kind of physical malady, some kind of thing that in the uh, theologians debate on what it was something issue with his, uh, his sight or with the, maybe with his hands uh, or just uh, some kind of chronic pain that was going on. Some people would think it's not even a physical thing. It's just a spiritual thing. Uh, the Bible doesn't really say to us, but it does say this, is that three different times he said, God, please remove this. Please get this out of my life. Please don't let this in. This hurts. This is painful. I don't like it. To which God responds in verse 9, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Hey, Paul, at times when you're weak, and times when you're sick, in times of uncertainty, in times of pain, I want you to know this, that my grace is is sufficient for you. I'm providing something for you. I'm meeting your needs. There's this need in your life, and it feels like what we would like to have happen is for God to remove it out of our life. Uh, but God says, no, I'm not going to remove it because I want to give you uh, my grace into your life. So Paul's response to this idea that God's grace is in his life, uh, and, it's, and it's made perfect, it's made complete in weakness. 
He says, Most gladly will I therefore glory in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon me. Now look, I know this may be a switch in your thinking. And there's, I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth when I say this. I'm just going to be fully transparent. But could it be that this virus is a good thing? Now, no, I know it doesn't do well for your 401k, all right? Uh, I know it doesn't do well for your kid's school schedule. And I know it doesn't do well for maybe your job or some other kind of planned trip you had or something you were going to watch on TV last week or this week or next month or this year. Who knows? But here's the thing, is God's, uh, God's not concerned about our American education system. That's not like why he gets up in the morning, if you will, and he's going to make it spin. Like, oh, good, we got to have a solid education. Everybody, like, oh, we just want all those little American kids to be well-educated and, 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 you know, and get all their days in so they don't have to be in the summer. They don't have to, like, that doesn't probably doesn't even enter his mind, all right? Because here's the thing, God's design isn't that people be well-educated like good Americans. His design is for His glory. His design is that people would find Him to be all in all. His, his design is that people uh, would, uh, would find Him to be all that they need. And so that God can take uh, something that is sinful and something that is wrong. He can take something that's good uh, as well, and He can introduce it into humanity so humanity realizes, I'm broken. This doesn't have any hope. This isn't helping me. Uh, and, and I don't know. Uh, I, I need a new Savior. For us who are saved, uh, we go through a difficulty, and God says, no, no, this is good. Why is it good? How is it good? Because it helps us realize uh, that we need God. It helps us see and trust God and have faith in God, and we understand that where we are weak, when we go through a hardship, then we get to experience the presence and the power of God. It's sort of like a win-win either way. We say, God, could you get rid of this? And God gets rid of it. Win. Whoa, this is great. Or he says, no, I'm giving you grace. I'm giving you supernatural ability to do, I'm, I'm going to give you the strength, the strength that comes from God, the strength that comes from the resurrection to be able to go through this pain, to be able to deal with this thorn in the flesh, to be able to stay connected to me and find sufficient, sufficiency in me. And I'm going to produce in you my fruit. I'm going to produce in you my spirit. I'm going to produce in you my likeness. And so that going through a difficult time when we pray about it and ask God to get rid of it, which is what we typically do, uh, sometimes God says, yes, praise the Lord. Sometimes God says, no. Praise the Lord, because we get to experience the power of God. It rests upon us. It's there. We get to experience God and his presence in our life like never before. Most gladly will I therefore glory in my infirmities. Why? That the power of God may rest upon me. Look, some of us this week have experienced the power of God in our life. We've, we've experienced Christ being formed in us. We've experienced a fellowship, a fullness of the Holy Spirit, a fellowship with God, perhaps like never before, because even before you got here on Sunday morning, uh, as the whole world is freaking out, you're just walking around the gospel circles. And you, you, get, a, you get a little bit anx anxious, nervous. Like, uh, oh yeah, I've got to remember God's love and grace. I've got to hear, I've got to get back over here and abide in the vine. I've got to get back over here and hang out with Jesus. I've got to get back over here and know that God is enough. God often withholds what we want in order to give us what we really need. God often withholds what we want so they give us what we really need. Think about all the things we wanted this week but didn't get. We kind of thought they were neat. You know, I got, I had, it's got to work this way. I've got to have my schedule. I've got to have enough, you know, 17 rolls that last me 82 days. Like, uh, you know, kind of doing the math on all that stuff. Like, I, I, and God sometimes withholds those things. Why? Because he wants to give us something that we actually need. What is that? Him. That's the thing we need. Look, I, I want my children to be well-educated. I do. But they don't need to be. I know that flies in the face of so much of what America lives for. But it's the truth. And sometimes God can withhold things from us. 
to give us what we really need. What would we do with all? I sort of noticed these things online. It's like day two of no sports. I noticed this lady sitting on my couch. It's my wife. You know, she's, <laughs> she's not like these, all these little things. And I'm sure they're, they're just getting started, folks. So get, well, buckle up and get, you know, and get ready for them. You know, sometimes God could withhold some things that we think we want. Or, like, I don't need to see LeBron James dunk another basketball. I've seen it thousands of times. I enjoy it. I don't mind. See, it's not a sin to do it. But the fact is, maybe God says, here, get rid of that. You, there's something more important you need in your life. Could it be possible that God is trying to give us, through this time, he's working some good things out to withhold something that we think we need in order to give us something that we truly need? What we think we want in order to give us something that we really, really do, I, I think when it all come, boils down, that we really want. When we experience pain on earth, it might uh, be... Uh, that we don't ask, it, it maybe that we, don't, we shouldn't ask why, but the bigger question really is how do we respond? That's the important thing, I think, isn't it? God, why is it? God, tell us all the reasons why this is happening. No, God, God never did that for anybody in the Bible. <laughs> He's never given all the reasons. In fact, Ephesians 1 says, in eternity to come, he will reveal the riches of his grace to us. We'll be learning for all of eternity why this happened. Why that happened, why he allowed this, what God was doing in that situation. But those things are not for us to know now. Last week, did we see uh, any emotional warning signs go off? Anybody experienced any stress last week? Anybody? (laughs) Yeah, I'll raise my hand. I was talking to our friends down here in the front. His company makes hand sanitizer, and she works for the hospital. I don't know, I'm just guessing. There might have been a little uh, a wacko going on in their house. <laughs> like, oh, what is going on? Uh, that's, that's incredible. Uh, you know, to have, have, have it going on in one house. So, man, all of us kind of experienced, had a, an emotional warning sign. I hope, I hope that there was a, there was a trigger that kind of went like, in my, oh, I got to get out of here and back into God's design. I got to get out of this brokenness and back into God's design. And I do that through the gospel. I do that, do that through God's love and through God's grace. When we experience pain on this earth, we, we, we probably could quit asking why, uh, but more be thinking about how do I respond. And here's how we want to respond. We want to respond by faith. Now, now here's the reality is, is we, we all respond by faith in something. We all respond by faith uh, in, in something. Here's a few ways in which perhaps uh, we might have responded last week. Over here in brokenness, we're in God's design, but we begin to doubt that God's enough. We begin to doubt that God has all the answers. We're going to go out here and try to figure it out on our own, in our own strength, in our own wisdom, the wisdom of the world. Uh, and so we kind of do things like this. We believe uh, in stockpiles. Man. All right, so we go out and we run out the store. We like, I gotta, you know, we get it. Look, nothing wrong with stocking up, okay? Uh, nothing wrong with having a few extra things on hand and being ready for things that, things that go wrong. But some of us, we put our faith in this. Our security is in the fact that we have rolls of cotton in the closet. Think about how silly that is. You know what? You know what we could we could kind of say that is an idol. It's an idol. I know we don't bow down to physical statues. We, we do worse things. <laughs> we can, this week, some people have bowed down to plastic bottles full of alcohol and aloe. You know, like, there's, like oh, I'm secure. And like, that's, there's security. I'm just suggesting that for the Christian, that our by faith response ought be in the gospel, that God's love and grace, that, our, that we're securing Christ, that he's meeting all of our needs, that he's providing everything that we need through whatever combination of things he's chosen to provide for us right now. That's how he is meeting our needs. And if we don't have it, it's because we don't need it. And where we lack or where we think we lack, guess what shows up? It's God's grace. It's God's love that fills those, so to speak, gaps for us. Some of us, this is what we're, oh, I, I got to hurry. I got to get uh, And we're just out there because we're a little anxious. Uh, there's, a, there's a worry, a fear, uncertainty about getting our needs met. So we kind of, some of us responded this way. We bowed down to the idol of Netflix. Can you read that from back there? Man, some of us thought, you know, if I can just watch my show again in the next episode, in the next episode, like, I'll just sit here long enough, this thing will go away. <laughs> uh, you know, and then you got to the end of your season, uh, and you're like, what am I going to do now? Because I don't have, you know, uh, and, and the idol sort of fades away. Some of us 
in response to this hardship, instead of running to God, instead of finding sufficient in Christ, uh, we, we, we trust in other things. Here's some of us, some of you haven't worried at all. No, you know, this is, I'm fine. My family is fine. It's not going to be a big deal. And here's why. You got savings. You've been diligent. I mean, you've been good. You've been, you've been putting money away for years. And the truth is, is while you don't want to dip into that account, the fact is, you're good. There's no reason to worry. There's no reason to panic because I, I got it. I'm not suggesting that you don't save. I, in fact, I think it's a good thing. But I think it's a horrible thing. In fact, God com- commands Timothy, Paul commands Timothy through the inspiration of, uh, of the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures to tell those who are rich in this world to not trust in uncertain riches. The Bible says riches make wings and they fly away for many a good reason. I'm not suggesting that we don't save money. I'm just suggesting that some of us worshiped this and put our confidence in this this week or were tempted to, or you might be tempted in the days to come. And I'm thankful that you have savings. I'm thankful that there's some things you might not have to stress about, but don't let that idol keep you out of God's design. Don't let that idol keep you in brokenness and not experiencing the sufficiency of Christ. Uh, Some of us, man, I got a lot of lines going on here. Let me try this one. I can't spell this morning. Some of us worshiped this this week, Clorox. Man, we got, you know, I got a bleach down. We got a, hey, I even came in this morning. I know the church was clean yesterday, but I brought some Mr. Clean and a spray bottle and a thing of paper towels. And I, came, I, just, I just sprayed all the surfaces that were going to be touched today, and I just wiped them down again just one more time just for the, just for the fun of it. But you know what? I want to tell you this. I didn't get all the germs. I didn't. There's germs here, okay? Uh, and, and the fact is, is like we're, you know, everybody's like, oh, you know, and we've and we got our security in the fact that we're not touching this, we're not going there, we're not doing this. Like, look, there, what I'm just saying is you might as well just have faith in God to take care of you, okay? I, I'm not suggesting that you lick the handrails, okay? Uh, I'm not suggesting that you go by the five-second rule anymore, okay? That might be not a, a, a good thing. But did you touch your shoes this morning? I mean, come on, let's get real for a second. Like, you touched your shoes. Where do your shoes go on a, on a, daily, on a daily basis? And you touch them. Did you wash your hands after you put your shoes on? Okay, so like, let's not totally freak about it. And let's not totally trust in Clorox. Johnson and Johnson is not the Savior uh, of the world. Jesus Christ is. And while we want to clean and while we want to just wave from a distance and do all the right things that we need to do uh, right now, we want to respond by faith in the gospel of Jesus, not in things uh, of this earth. Hey, some, some of us are out here going like this. Man, we're just really relying on these folks to help us out. Uh, or we might be kind of expecting our government to do all the right things and make the right decisions and handle it all the right way. I'm just sort of suggesting that these are really bad idols, okay? These are really bad little capital, lowercase g gods to worship at. And I'm sort of having a little fun with this this morning, but you understand that many times our response to pain, our response to difficulty, is to run out here farther away from God into more brokenness, trying to find significance, trying to find security, trying to find love, trying to find something to hold on to. As I prayed early this morning that some, the Bible says, trust in chariots and some in horses. But the people of God remember God. And that is the mercy of God. It's not that he's incapable, 2 Peter says. It's it's that he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God allows these things into our life. So that we uh, could come to know Christ. So that we could return uh, to Christ and trust Him. This is how we're saying, look, anytime you want to live for one of these, worship one of these, trust one of these, you can. That's, what the, that's how the world responds without Jesus Christ. But because of Jesus Christ, we've been saved from an everyday existence. We've been saved from our everyday life. We've been saved from the anxiety and the fear and the worry and the stress uh, of the, that these things create and the hype that it creates in our life because we have access to God by the blood of Jesus Christ. On the way to church, my wife uh, told me, she said, you know, I could have helped you with your message or something like that. Uh, she goes, I, I hate to tell you right now what to preach. Um, I asked, yeah, you, you should have told me a few days ago uh, we could have worked it in. She goes, but you know, you could spend your whole time talking about uh, the emotional warning sign of anxiety. 
anxiety, where we all kind of felt some of that this week. Uh, you know, just think about, like, my, my anxiety isn't for this moment because, like, my, I've got food in my fridge. I'm not really worried about, there's a little money in the bank. You know, we're, we're good. But, like, you know, if, if we, you know, you know, thinking, if this happens and these people don't work and then people stop coming to church and that happens, then, like, we might have to, man, like, and then, and then like, and, you, know, you think eight, ten weeks down the road, and then, and then I start to get a little, a little anxious. Man, I was okay with them uh, canceling the Players' Championship down in, uh, you know, down in Jacksonville. If you follow golf, you know what I'm talking about. But then they postponed the Masters. I'm like, wait a minute. I guess we can't, like, we can't just go around just change, you know, changing stuff uh, like that. I, like, I, I like, that's what I, I kind of like. I want that. That's part of my life. I want to see that every, every March. It, you know, it's part of what we do. Anxiety is defined as the uncertainty of getting what we think we need. The uncertainty. Am I going to get it? Is it going to come? Is it going to be taken care of the things that I think we need? But here's the reality is, is that what we need has already been provided for us by God. What we need is God's love and grace plus nothing that is enough. That is the essence of the gospel. That is the essence of faith. That's what we believe for reconciliation. That's what we're believing for glorification. And I'm just suggesting the Bible wants us to believe it for right now in our sanctification, in our everyday life uh, that we live, that God will meet all our needs. He will not meet all our wants, but he meets all our needs. And he does so in whatever combination of things that he's chosen to provide for us. May I suggest that we place our faith in the gospel. Especially in times like these, we can find our security in Christ. And when we do and we connect to this life-giving source, the Holy Spirit through us produces love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You'll never produce that stuff over there. You'll imitate it. You'll stress about it. You'll try to be disciplined, to love your neighbor and do this thing. But I'm suggesting over there you'll not find it because it's really worshiping self ultimately. Uh, and we need to come through the gospel back uh, to God's design in our life. Let me just share with you a couple of verses as we kind of come towards the end here. First John 4 and verse 17 says this, Here in his love made perfect that... Uh, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. Now look, this verse is talking about God judging the earth for their sinfulness. And what the Bible says, hey, perfect love casts out fear. If you have experienced the perfect love of God, there is no need for you to fear the day of judgment that is coming on those who reject God's design and God's provision in their life. Perfect love casts out fear. And because we have the access to that love right now, because we have access to that grace right now, we know that there is no need to fear in this moment. There is no need to fear in this day because uh, we have the perfect love of God uh, that we experience in our life. It's a reality. I'm so thankful it doesn't depend on uh, your church attendance, like showing up to a physical location. Other, otherwise, half the people in our church would not have access to God's grace and God's love today. But that's not how you access it. You access it uh, by faith in Jesus Christ. He's the one that made it possible by shedding his blood on the cross. And so when we love, when God loves us and we stand in that, it casts out the fear of failure. It casts out the fear of messing up. It casts out the fear uh, of, of torment. torment. And we love him because he first loved us. First Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, for we, know, we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Man, uh, we, got, we don't have that spirit of bondage in these things, uh, and we don't have the spirit of fear, but we have the spirit of adoption. We're in the family. We're connected to God because of Jesus Christ. And so because of that, we go, Daddy, we can cry out to our Heavenly Father, we're well connected for whatever life's situations may throw at us. I'd encourage you to read the rest of Romans 8 from there as it shares a number of great truths to help us see it builds up to that verse where it says, and we know 
that all things work together for them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Let me give you in closing this morning just a biblical response uh, to the coronavirus. Or we could call this the corona challenge. All right. Here's what I would challenge you to do. Because we're equipped with the gospel, because the grace of God and the love of God is presently accessible through the blood of Jesus Christ, may I encourage you, first of all, to respond in faith. Respond in faith. 2, Tim, 2 Peter 1, 4 says this, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be the partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. When you break that verse down, we've been talking about this with our teens for a couple weeks uh, now uh, in Ignite Teens, uh, but we've been given exceeding great and precious promises. That God's love and grace plus nothing is enough. That, that we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That before the foundation of the world, God chose us and he brought us, adopted us into his family. Uh, and that he, he's made us his workmanship. That we would, were created unto good works. The promises of God are absolutely endless for us. And by those promises, we can partake of the divine nature. We can abide in the vine. We can, be, uh, we can rest in Jesus Christ. We can be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit producing His nature, the nature of Jesus Christ in uh, and through our lives. And when we do that, guess what happens? We escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. We get saved from today. We don't have to live over here. We don't have to live in trusting in them. We don't have to be freaking out uh, and experiencing anxiety and depression and, uh, you know, and, and anger and all, all the different things that come uh, with our not trusting in God. We can escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let's have faith. How do we do that very practically? I would encourage you uh, to worship God. Look, during this time, whether it lasts two days or two years, during this time, I want to encourage you not to return to an idol or not to worship a new one. If we're not careful, we'll find ourselves in a fleshly response, in a broken response, bowing down to something else that we think might bring us comfort or security or love or significance when what we need to do is worship the true God. Don't forget Deuteronomy chapter 6. Don't forget why the thorn of the flesh is there. It's there to help us to remember that His grace is sufficient, that His promises are true. In, in faith, we would pray. Hey, I'm not suggesting you won't be worried. I'm not suggesting you might get frustrated. I'm not uh, suggesting that you won't have moments of anxiousness. But when you are, we're human and fleshly, we're going to have those responses I'm saying to bring them to God, to worship God, to, to, to meditate uh, on his truth and on his promises. We probably all need a corona verse, all right? We probably all need a verse that we stick in our pocket, and when you get the anxious or when someone like, accidentally shakes your hand, you're like, oh, uh, you know, like you could like, whip that verse out and go, here's the promise that I'm holding on to. Here's what's reminding me of God's love and his grace and his sovereignty and his power. This thing is not going to consume me. I'm not going to run in fear. I'm not going to clam up and just shut down my life the days that God has given me just uh, because, uh, because I'm trusting other things. I'm going to trust in the truth that comes from God's word. I'm going to have faith. Read my Bible. If you run out of things to read, let me know. I have a number of things I would love to give you uh, and encourage you to read that would help build and strengthen uh, your faith. Don't fall apart. In Joshua 1.9, he says to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. That word dismayed is just a funny picture because it means to fall apart. Uh, it, it talks about sometimes in the Old Testament, the enemies of Israel. Uh, he, God says, the enemies will be dismayed at me. You know, like, you just imagine like God shows up, like, oh, we're going to beat up these Israelites. And all of a sudden, God rolls in and they're, oh, you know, like, and they, and they run, they freak out and they run the other, the other way. That's the, that's the picture that conjures up in mind. Look, don't fall apart during this. Don't be dismayed. Be of good courage because God has promised wherever it is you go, I'm there. So I won't fear. Uh, the, the Bible says in Hebrews that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I, I won't fear what man can do unto me because God's presence is there in my life. There's nothing happening in my life that's taking God by surprise. We must have faith. Secondly, we must have hope. Hope. Hope in heaven. 
hope uh, in the glory that is to come. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that she shall be revealed in us. In Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, we're going to look at this next week when we talk about that future salvation, the hope of glory. Uh, but the Bible says that we have access uh, into the grace and we rejoice in the hope uh, of glory. I know I said last week that we probably, nobody's really wanted to go to heaven, but I think probably after uh, a week like this, we're like, oh, now would be a good time for Jesus to come back. You know, now would be a time to be done. I don't want to see where this thing ends. I don't want to get on the, like, just take me now, Jesus. Like, I'm ready. Uh, I'm ready to go. For the Christian, there is to be a, a hope of a better future, a brighter future. And I'm not talking about Thursday. Like, the truth is, the truth is, is this could be the beginning of the end. Does that sound bad? Does that sound, this could be. It could be. We don't know. But that doesn't have to bother us because we have hope in the glory of God. We have hope. That there's, there's a life that's way better than this one that we're going to live for all of eternity after this one. So however it ends, let it come. There's nothing to fear. There's nothing to worry. There's nothing to cower back. Again, don't lick the handrails. But we have hope in a brighter future. Can I encourage you in this? Um, just, these are very practical. But I'd encourage you to, to exercise. I'd encourage you to walk. I'd encourage you to move around. There's something about some of this like this, uh, I mean, and it's kind of cold still, and it's a little rainy, and we just want to you know, sit in our, you know, just eat Doritos and chili and watch the TV and just kind of like just try to, weather the storm here. Look, don't, this is super practical, and now I'm starting to preach instead of just talking about the Bible. Don't gain 25 pounds because of the coronavirus. <laughs> don't do that. You know what that says to a world who is lost in darkness? It says, I don't have any answers either. Let's go eat ourselves to death. Let's go trust in this bag of food to take away our problems. No, Jesus died on the cross to save us from that. Let's not display a lack of faith in such a, such, a, such a way. I'm not saying don't eat Doritos. I'll probably have some this afternoon. But I'm just saying let's use self-control. Let's have some hope in the future like there probably will be a next week. And even if there isn't a next week, there is an eternity. So let's not act as if the world is coming to an end. Let the world do that. People are in darkness. People are lost. People don't have hope. That's how they respond. That should not shock us. But let us have hope. Thirdly, I believe we need, oh, wait, one more thing about hope. Turn off the news. <laughs> uh, get an update. Stay connected with what's going on. But don't let that thing run for hours on end in the, in the background and just constantly coming into your life and into your home. That will not help. I don't care uh, what network it is. It's not going to help. Uh, turn, turn it off. All right, number three, <laughs> charity. Faith, hope, charity. That is, in God's design, the greatest commandment is that we love God. And the second is likened to the first, that we would love our neighbor as ourself. Because when we have all that we need from God, then we are free to meet the needs of others for God. Even in a time like this, it, we need to be careful. The Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians 13, that though I have the tongues of men and angels, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. James says, faith without works is dead. Be alone. Don't be the person in your neighborhood. Don't, don't be the person in your, in your little mission field that just hunkers down and all you're thinking about is yourself. That is not the way that God desires for us to live. That does not bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. That does not display faith or hope uh, in any way, shape, or form. We ought to look for opportunities to shine. Simple ways of just even spending quality time with your own family. Look, there's some, there's some, you might have some extra time on your hand the next few weeks. Don't waste it. Use it to love others. Don't use it selfishly. Use it to love others. Look for ways to be Jesus on display 
in your everyday life. The most encouraging thing I saw yesterday that I can remember outside of the Bible uh, was a post uh, that Tasia Latrell, maybe it was even Friday that she posted this. You may have seen it, but she says, hey, while you're out shopping and stockpiling, you should maybe grab a few extra and take it by some donation center for some people that could use a little extra help. And I, it, was the, it was sort of the first that I could remember response of someone who was just like, hey, quit thinking about yourself and just think about other people. I was like, man, that's, 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 I just love seeing that just a small little gesture in some way, but it's like, hey, uh, think not every man on his own things, but on the things of others, the Bible says. And that's the way the Christian should respond in charity. Here's, can I ask us to do this as a church? I really want us to pray about a way in which God would have us to shine. I know that's what we, you know, it's on our stuff, and we say we want to be Jesus on display in our everyday life, and that, that's our mantra here, if you will. It's kind of our, uh, our mission statement. But here is a time, a dark time in our world, that the light of the glorious gospel should shine from us to other people. And if we can't find a way to be light in this darkness, when would we exactly shine? When would we actually get out of ourselves uh, and invest and love on people who need to know the love of Jesus Christ? And so maybe just on an individual level, we can pray and say, God, help me not to get inside of myself. I want to get in my own head. Help me not to put myself first. But may I love you and love others because I've been loved uh, by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then maybe even as a church, how can my city group, how can my church, how can we love on this neighborhood? How can we love on that school? How can we love on this group of people? How could we uh, show the love of Christ. Look, this is the time. This is where the Bible says, be ready to give a reason to any man who asks the reason of hope that is within you. Be ready to give an answer. How would you care about me at this time? How, how could you share your toilet paper with me? You know, and, and it would be because I'm not, my, I, my hope is in heaven. My hope is in God because God's loved me and he's meeting my needs and he's led me, you know, led me to do this or that. I know it's not all about toilet paper, but you sort of get the idea. It's pretty simple that God can and does, is saving us from COVID-19. And if there's a 20, he'll do the same thing and saving us from that as well. Because God provides his love and grace. He provides his promises so that we can partake in divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. But it really comes down to faith and what God will we worship. We worship these ones that are made up. We worship the ones that won't really satisfy. Our song that the kids sing up here this morning, Jesus said, if you thirst, come to him. No one else can satisfy. Jesus said, if you're weak, come to me. No one else can give you strength. Jesus said, if you are afraid, come to me. I, no one else can be your shield. Jesus said, if you're lost, I will come to you. Jesus, strong in kind. Jesus, saving us from our everyday life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this truth. I pray that it's been a hope and a help to your people. Lord, there will be emotional warning signals this week that trigger in our heart and our mind. And when they do, when those lights go off on the dash, I pray that our immediate response would be to trust in your love and your grace. And to trust and by faith to find you sufficient. Allow your Holy Spirit to direct us to the truth of God's word that would fill our hearts with the love of God. We would love God so much that it would constrain us, as Paul said. Constrain me to live out the life of Jesus Christ. May our community in this day and this week and the times to come, may they see Jesus on display from the people that gather and worship here on a regular basis. And for all that you do through this, we'll give you the glory and the honor. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's